Wednesday was supposed to be a great day where the Gamecocks could celebrate the first ever episode of the Welcome Home South Carolina Football TV miniseries. But Wednesday apparently had some other ideas. We'll be discussing why today on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and as always, thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your podcasts daily. All right, so I've got a lot to unpack for today's Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, and Unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit more bad than good. As I mentioned, the cold open yesterday was the debut episode of South Carolina's TV miniseries that is happening during the month of August and the first week of September. Welcome home, South Carolina football. Covering all the behind the scenes stuff going on with the football program, heading into this upcoming season and including maybe some highlights from the spring. I'll be covering that at the top of the show i also, however, have some bad news to discuss, which involves a couple of hits the Gamecocks took on the recruiting front with football. A blue chip target announcing a surprise commitment to another school he was considering. What all changed with that? Along with a blue chip commit flipping from the Gamecocks to an SEC foe. Who were these blue chip targets? And lastly, I will be discussing a real big injury development regarding one of the transfers that the Gamecocks got for the men's basketball team this past off season. So because of all this, I'm going to do what I would always do with these kind of discussions. I'm going to start off with the good from Wednesday. So for segment one, let's talk about some of the takeaways from episode one of South Carolina's Welcome Home TV miniseries. Um, obviously, something, as I mentioned before, really cool for the South Carolina Gamecocks to make happen. A big opportunity for them to build their brand, show the rest of the country what Coach Shane Beamer has going on with this football program, the culture that he is building. And for South Carolina fans, of course, getting a behind-the-scenes look more so than ever before, really, into what all is happening with some of the players on the team and not just the coaches. So I had three main takeaways from Episode 1 last night. My first one being that Shane Beamer clearly doesn't forget the past. And the reason why I mention this is there was a part of the show early on where it showed the Gamecocks heading to williams Bryce Stadium for their Garner Black Spring game back on April 16th of this year. And when the Gamecocks went out to the field, Shane Beamer gave his team some clear instructions. He told them, when we do our breakdown, I want you guys to jog all the way over to the other end zone where we have all of our former players who were able to make it out for this spring game tonight. And I want y'all to do your breakdown with all of these guys. I have goosebumps literally talking about this because here's why this is so important. Alumni relations, whether you go to a school for academics or obviously you go to a school for athletics or obviously both in these former players' case, this is something that is always important with every single football program. You can never forget where you came from, which led to you being where you are right now. And... This is something that, based on what Shane Bieber did with this moment before the spring game, he clearly shows he understands this. He gets this. And with South Carolina, it's different. Look, we understand we're not a football program that has a ton of history compared to some other schools. You know, schools like Florida, who's won national championships, Georgia, who's won a couple national championships, obviously Bama, LSU, you name it. So when we have players who come to South Carolina to play football here, we truly appreciate you. The fans will love you for life. You are forever Garnet. You are forever a Gamecock because you took a path that wasn't traveled as much by other maybe big-time players. And obviously when you're homegrown, it's different. But either way, when you come to South Carolina to play here, you will be forever embraced by this fan base. And because of that, this stuff is extremely important. Those guys should never be forgotten. And Shane mentioned at the beginning of his tenure here in a press conference leading into his first season, I believe, 
and it was regarding like uniform combos that, you know, he is a traditionalist. He is somebody that believes in tradition. And while he understands everything about what's happening now in modern times with social media and all that, and he's willing to participate in that kind of stuff, he wants to appreciate the past just as much, if not more. And this showcased that a great deal this part of the show last night. And I feel like that shouldn't go unnoticed. Another takeaway that I had from the episode, Zach Pickens is ready to be a leader for this defense. I was very pumped up, and Gamecock fans should be very pumped up to see that Zach Pickens clearly looks like he is ready to take on a real big leadership role this year, especially vocally. In the spring game, there was plenty of segments that were shown with Zach Pickens being mic'd up, where he was cheering on his teammates from the sidelines, when Zach Pickens was communicating with his teammates when he was out there on the field and actually playing, and even a really lighthearted moment after the game or before the game where Zach Pickens walked up to a couple of his teammates and gave them hugs and, you know, really embraced them like they were a brother of his. And obviously, Shane Beamer's culture has been built around family. It's been built around guys caring about each other more than just teammates that play between the white lines for 60 minutes on 12 Saturdays a year. But with Zach Pickens showing what he showed in last night's episode, I think that Zach Pickens has become an embodiment of what Chamber wants guys to be in this program. And obviously, Zach Pickens has always been very talented. He is someone that some people have said maybe hasn't lived up to the hype of his five-star building coming out of high school. I find that to be a little bit ridiculous because I think the stats show Pickens has done just fine the last couple of years. I think he's played really well. And I think that based on what I saw last night, I think he's primed to have an even better year this year because it seems like he is completely bought in to what this program is and wants to be. My last takeaway from last night's show, Marshawn Lloyd, he is the true definition of driven. We all know what happened with his ACL injury leading into his freshman campaign back in 2020. Marshawn obviously went through a lot with that, and even last season was still dealing with some lingering effects, especially from the mental side of things. It was clear to most Gamecock fans who saw him play in high school based on his film, and maybe those that had the chance to watch him in practice, that he was not the same guy. This year, Marshawn looks like he is on a mission. Shane Beamer has mentioned this multiple times in multiple press conferences. And seeing how he ran in the spring game, Marshawn ran angry. And you, and for a guy who's like, you know, 5'8", maybe 5'9", around 200 pounds, you cannot underestimate the mentality and the drive that Marshawn Lloyd has. And there was another part of the show last night that cannot be overlooked. When he went to play high school ball, he played at the Matha Catholic School. The issue for Marshawn was he is from Delaware originally. So it was mentioned how his mom would have them leaving the house at like 4.30 in the morning to take him all the way over to the Matha Catholic, which was around two and a half hours away from their home. And they would normally end up getting back to the house late at night, sometimes as late as 10 o'clock. I got to be honest, if I was in Marshawn's shoes, I had that kind of opportunity, but I had to go that far away to a high school in order to make my dreams a reality, to maybe give myself a better chance. I got to be honest, me being 14 to 18 years old, I don't know how much I would have enjoyed doing what he had to do, but that just tells you how much Marshawn is committed to his craft. It tells you how much he cares about football, how serious he takes this sport. And when you see all this as a Gamecock fan, and you know everything he's been through, you just want to see him be able to put it all together this year. You want to see him finally be able to show, not just Gamecock fans, but the entire country, why he was billed as such a highly tired prospect coming out of high school, why he was projected to be the starter heading into the 2020 season ahead of even a guy like Kevin Harris, who, by the way, rushed for over 1,000 yards that same season, and you know was going to be the starter before he tore his ACL. Marshawn Lloyd's The Definition of Driven. Last night's episode definitely showed that. I thought it was a fantastic start to the show, really getting to show everyone else across the country things that maybe Gamecock fans have already seen, but again, really showing them what this program is made of, and I think the next few episodes are going to include a lot more on you know maybe some personal stories from these players and, of course, things that are going on in fall camp. So that was all the good stuff that happened from Wednesday. But unfortunately, there was also a few things that did not go the Gamecocks' way, especially on the recruiting front. Yesterday, admittedly, might have been 
the toughest recruiting day the Gamecocks have had in quite some time. Why was this the case? Well, I'll get into all of that in just a few moments, but I do need to talk to y'all about Built Bar real quick. Now, for those of you who are watching this right now or listening to it, if you're on audio podcasts, and you may be interested in finding a good, nutritious, and healthy protein bar, there's a new flavor out at Built Bar right now, and it is a can't-miss protein bar. So I'll tell you just in a few words, cookie dough and marshmallow covered in chocolate. Have I sold you on it yet? I haven't? Okay, I'll explain further then. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories. They have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. It's literally the perfect treat. I got some of these from Built themselves not too long ago, and they're one of my favorite protein bars out there right now. I get multiple different protein bars from Built Bar, but cookie dough, I'm telling y'all, it is the real deal. What's also great about Built is all their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body, of course, absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Whether you need a snack after a workout, a late night treat, or you just need to grab a quick bite, Bill is the perfect protein bar. And at the same time, it tastes better than a candy bar, which is insane. So what are you doing? Get to Bilt.com right now to order your box of cookie dough chunk puffs today. And if you're looking to save money with everything we've got going on right now, we've got you covered there as well. When you go to Bilt.com, be sure to use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your order. Again, that is LOCKED15 for 15% off at Bilt.com. Go right now while the offer lasts. Welcome back, Gamecock fans. Before I get into segment two real quickly, just want to once again thank you for listening to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast where we cover Gamecock sports every single day. All right, so for segment two, time to get to some of the bad news that occurred just yesterday. So let's start off with the flip that the Gamecocks suffered from four-star linebacker Jaden Robinson, who flipped his commitment from South Carolina to Florida. So obviously, this is a loss that stings the Gamecocks to a certain degree. Now, the Gamecocks, of course, had four-star linebacker Grayson Howard and four-star linebacker Jane Robinson both committed for around a month or so together in this class. And, of course, Grayson Howard has been very active on social media in terms of helping the Gamecocks recruiting efforts really since he committed to the Gamecocks. Jaden Robinson, while I'm not going to say he didn't do any sort of tweeting to help out South Carolina, and obviously that's not a requirement of him being a commitment to have to tweet constantly about the Gamecocks, he was not tweeting anywhere near as much as some of these other guys. So I start to have some suspicions because of that. But what really set off alarm bells to me in my mind that this might be coming down the pipe was when I heard the news that Jaden Robinson had attended the Florida Gators cookout event on July the 29th at the end of last month. Obviously, hearing that, that tells you clear as day, you don't even have to be someone that falls recruiting consistently, that Jaden Robinson still had interest in the Florida Gators. Now, I will say this. Jaden Robinson was offered by the Gators literally, I think, two days before he committed to the Gamecocks. But what y'all need to remember, some of you who may still be, you know, not taking this decommitment very well, is Jaden Robinson is a Florida kid. He grew up in Lake City, Florida, or is fr- at least right now currently planted in Lake City, Florida. He plays at Columbia High School down there. And I think that the Florida Gators was his dream school. And while, yes, Florida may have sort of waited a little while before finally offering him right before he committed to the Gamecocks, um, when you have a school that's your dream school and you're given an opportunity to play there and, you know, he's 17, 18 years old, you can totally understand where he is coming from on this. Obviously, if Florida wanted him badly enough, you know, combine that with the fact that it seems like he grew up loving the Gators, then that's pretty hard for him to turn down. I actually watched Brandon Olson from Lockdown Gators last night with his immediate reaction to the Jane Robinson commitment for them from their perspective. And he mentioned in his video how the Gators apparently were in a real dire need of linebackers in their class. So you throw that in there as well, you know, saying that you would be our guy if we took you or if you were willing to come here, then obviously that probably pushed him over the edge. So, you know, I, I will say let's not let's not be upset at Jaden Robinson again. He's just a 17, 18 year old kid who's trying to make one of the biggest decisions of his soon to be early adult life at this point. 
And, you know, he's making a four-year decision for the next four years for where he wants to play football. And, you know, of course, there's the old cliche saying, you know, it's not four years, it's 30 years or 35 years or 40 years, whatever. But the point is, Jaden Robinson has flipped to the Florida Gators, and I hate to say it, I don't see any way the Gamecocks have a shot at getting him back. I think that this is a flip that's going to stick, uh, at least just from the outside looking in. This just does not seem like one where South Carolina's going to have a real chance to get back in this one. I think Jay Robinson sticks with the Florida Gators after this flip. So the question now is where do the Gamecocks go from here? Well, the Gamecocks did offer four-star safety Terrence Love, who is a current Auburn commit, just 10 days ago. Now, Terrence Love has made it clear that he is a safety. He's also a guy that has played, I think, some wide receiver in high school. However, there are certain recruiting services that do think that there is a possibility that he could be a college linebacker. And you may be wondering, well, why would we go after a guy who considers himself a four-star safety and is listed by some recruiting services as a four-star safety when we lost a four-star linebacker? Well, Jay Robinson, the thing that stood out to me about him, his coverage ability for a guy who is a linebacker was phenomenal. He was doing a great job of keeping up with wideouts at certain rivals camps and other camps as well that he participated in throughout his offseason. And, you know, compared to Grayson Howard, who, you know, is a guy that just can go right through the line of scrimmage and is great, in, especially in the run game, and has some coverage ability, Jaden Robinson is a guy that can cover just about anybody. Terrence Love would bring that kind of ability to the table. So, needless to say, don't be surprised if the Gamecocks really ratchet up their push on Terrence Love to try to get him maybe to come for an official visit, which he has mentioned with Gamecock Central's Chris Clark before that he very well plans on doing, at least taking some official visits because he's 50-50 apparently on his commitment with Auburn as of right now, according to Chris Clark's article from a while back. So this is going to be one to watch going forward. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, I do think Jane Robinson is going to stick as a Gator for the rest of this class, unless something just quite unforeseen happens here. Now, regarding... Carmelo Taylor, a four-star wide receiver out of Roanoke, Virginia, who announced a surprise commitment to Penn State yesterday. Uh, this was one that really no Gamecock fans saw coming. And this, of course, comes on the heels of Carmelo Taylor pushing back or postponing his commitment not once, but twice. He was originally expected to commit on July 25th. Then he pushed it back six days. Okay, you know, a lot of prospects do that. No big deal. But then he postponed his commitment again from July 31st. And in an article that was posted by Phil Kornblut of Sports Talk Media Network back on August the 4th, he asked Carmelo Taylor about his potential status as a commit or, you know, when he was going to announce his commitment maybe later down the line. And Carmelo Taylor said, quote, I think I'm going to wait a little bit and apparently did not elaborate in his conversation with Phil as to how much longer he planned to wait. Now, if Carmelo Taylor had not committed to the Gamecocks, I would have thought that Virginia Tech would have had a really solid chance to get him. He's a home state kid. Virginia Tech seems to have some excitement brewing with Brent Pry, the former Penn State defensive coordinator, ironically enough. With him now being at the helm, there's some excitement in Hokie land right now. And I figured he would have gone to them if he didn't come here. Because the weird thing about Penn State with this whole situation was they were considered to be the third team out of this group of contenders with Virginia Tech and South Carolina leading up to Carmelo Taylor's original commitment dates. So I'm not quite certain what really happened that changed things here. Although, you know, things do happen in recruiting. Stuff can happen out of the blue that fans do not expect. I will say this. I don't think this coaching staff is going to give up on recruiting Carmelo Taylor. He was a priority target for them this entire summer really. And right now, the Gamecocks don't really have any of the targets they're heavily in the game for that they can really push and potentially get. Guys like four-star wide receivers Tyler Williams and Aiden Williams and three-star wide receiver Caden Lee, they're all heavy leans elsewhere. Tyler Williams to Georgia, Aiden Williams to Ole Miss, his home state team. And Caden Lee, I mean, was looking at South Carolina at the beginning and there seemed to be some mutual interest, but things have really fallen off between both parties, it seems like for the last several months, even before the summertime hit. So I'm not quite certain where the Gamecocks would go from here at the wide receiver spot for the recruiting board if Carmelo Taylor ends up sticking with the Penn State and the Lions. But like I said earlier, I don't think the Gamecocks will give up here. And I think that this recruiting battle is far from over, at least from my perspective.
Welcome back to the final segment of today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. And as I mentioned earlier with today's show, thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily listen every single day. All right, so the last bit of news from Wednesday, a wild Wednesday it was, comes from the men's basketball front as the Gamecocks got some really tough news that, from what I saw on Twitter, was first reported by the Post and Courier's David Cloninger, who announced that transfer guard from Coastal Carolina, Ibrima Dibba, I hope I got that name pronunciation correct, I promise I'm trying to do better on that, will miss the 2022 through 23 season after sustaining an injury to his Achilles. He apparently has already had surgery and has begun his rehab. And while I do not want to speculate on what this injury might have been, I have to assume that this means that Dibba tore his Achilles tendon, which I would, again, hope that's not the case. But, you know, based on the wording of the tweet right there, I just have to imagine that was what the injury was. And if so, this is going to be a really long and arduous rehabilitation process for Dibba to have to endure. And this is a big loss for the South Carolina men's basketball team heading into this fall. As Dibba was a very experienced transfer. I mean, he's a guy that was about to go into his fifth year coming into this season, and he's played in 90 career games. And no matter how talented or, you know, maybe not so talented you are, you cannot replace experience easily whatsoever. He also showed great passing ability in his time at Coastal Carolina. Just this past season, he averaged 5.4 assists per game, which ranked 22nd in all of Division I men's college basketball. A very high mark for a college basketball player. He also brought a really unique frame at the guard position, being listed at six foot six or six foot seven, depending on where you look. So size-wise, he would have been a mismatch for a lot of defenders he would have been going up against. So with this news on Dibba and him again being out for a very long while with this Achilles injury, where do the Gamecocks look to? Well, the Gamecocks do have three guards who are going to get minutes heading to this season no matter what. Those guards being Jacoby Wright, Chico Carter Jr., and Mechie Johnson, the transfer out of Ohio State. But with this injury to Ibrima Dibba, it seems like now that freshman Zachary Davis will have to be relied on much more this upcoming season. And Zachary, ironically enough, seems to have a pretty similar game to Ibrima Dibba as He's six foot eight, but yet he plays the guard position. Again, you just don't see many guards that have that kind of size to him. And he is more known for his passing than, say, his scoring ability. Not saying that he can't get buckets, but he is a really solid passer with a very high IQ, just like Dibba. And another thing to note, the Gamecocks do also have one more available scholarship for this next season that they can utilize. So, with this new injury, I would not be surprised to see Lamont Paris get more aggressive in this transfer portal, maybe try to find one final addition for this roster, especially at the guard slot heading into this next season. I will say he's going to have to find this guy very quickly because fall practice for the men's basketball team is only a couple months away. He needs to get someone in here who can start to go ahead and practice with the team, start to learn the system, how Lamont Paris wants this offense to run, and of course his defense as well. And, you know, try to get as much time with the team as possible to get acclimated to everything. So that's going to be vital for Lamont Paris. And again, I'm sure he's already tried to put out some feelers to maybe gauge interest with a couple transfer portal prospects. So again, Abrima Dibba, a really big loss for the Gamecocks here in the guard rotation. And, you know, Lamont Paris is now going to have to work a little bit harder for the ending of this offseason and try to find somebody who can maybe fill in those shoes, at least to a certain capacity, heading into this upcoming season. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do for today's show of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show. As always, what were your thoughts on the first episode of the Welcome Home South Carolina Football TV miniseries last night. Was there anything that I didn't mention on today's show that really caught your attention? How excited are you for the rest of the series coming out every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on ESPNU? Also, what are your thoughts on these recent developments on the football recruiting front? How big of a loss do you think Jay Robinson is? Do you think that the Gamecocks have a real shot here with Terrence Love? And also, is there a wide receiver maybe that I didn't mention that you think the Gamecocks could go after if Carmelo Taylor is a long-gone conclusion and will stay committed to Penn State? 
Also, what are your thoughts on the Abrima Dibba injury and the impact it could have for the men's basketball team this next season? I do want to hear all of y'all's thoughts down below in the comments section if you're watching this on YouTube. But, of course, if you're listening to this on an audio podcast app, wherever you get your podcast daily, you can also feel free to shoot me a message at a lion underscore SC on Twitter, and I'll be sure to respond to any replies or comments that you have for me as quickly as I see them. And, of course, as always, if you've enjoyed the Locked On Gamecocks podcast and you want to get more news on the entire SEC conference, then make Locked On SEC your second listen every day, where host Chris Gordy and the local experts of Locked On take you across the entire SEC in just 30 minutes. So, again, make Locked On SEC your second listen after, of course, the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But once again, y'all, that's going to do it for me on today's show. Hope that y'all have a great rest of your Thursday, and I'll catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.